Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see you here. Welcome to the Forum for Philosophy. My name is Sarah Fine. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at King's College London, and I'm also a fellow here at the Forum. Okay, on to fashion and beauty. What do our clothes say about us? Is fashion a symbol of conformity and the commodification of bodies, or can it be an expression of our individuality? Is beauty about ethics as well as aesthetics? And what's the place of gender and race in these debates? Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome our wonderful panel of experts to analyze the cultural, political, and philosophical dimensions of fashion and beauty. To my right, we have Shahid Abari, who's a writer, academic, and broadcaster. I'm slightly out of breath. <laughs> We're having fun at the station here. Got the blood flowing. <laughs> she's Professor of Fashion Cultures and Histories at the London College of Fashion, and she's also the author of Dressed, The Secret Life of Clothes, which was published this year by Jonathan Cape and is on sale outside. We have Yashka Moore, who's a designer and writer, and to quote from her website, she works to clothe the mind through exploring the relationship between space, objects, and the architecture of the psyche. She argues that clothing is psychoactive. Through wearing garments, we can anchor ourselves into new states of being or dismantle current states of affairs. So you can see exactly why Yashka's on this panel tonight. She's also worked with composer Richard Melconian in collaboration with the Guildhall and the Royal Opera House to create the Geniza Opera. Heather Widows, to my left, is the John Ferguson Professor of Global Ethics in the Department of Philosophy at Birmingham University, and she is the author of Perfect Me, Beauty as an Ethical Ideal, also on sale outside <laughs> later. So without further ado, we're going to get started. I'm going to ask the panel a series of questions. We're going to open up to you as well for comments and questions. And first of all, I'm going to ask Shahida to get us started. So could you tell us why fashion and beauty are important topics for philosophical discussion? Yes, I think I can. Um, well, firstly, I, I write about dress in general, but fa I'm particularly interested in, in some fashion designers, but I write about dress in general, which I think is important to say. Uh, but um, I, where, ha coming to an event where someone as thoughtful and as clever and as esteemed as you is asking that question is quite, I'm not, I'm not being facetious, I, I, it seems to be quite a turnaround for me because when I started my book seven years ago, I remember being at a philosophy event um, in Hay on Wai and trialling this idea that I had about a book about dress and philosophy and I remember a philosopher put up his hand um, and he was a man of a certain age, white, uh, he was wearing jeans and, um, and he said, um, Dr. Bari, this is all very interesting but none of the really important thinkers I care about talk about dress or think about dress. And I remember my, just withering, <laughs> just wilting on the stage. And then I thought, he's wearing jeans. And I said to him, I know, <laughs> it's something that might make you laugh. But uh, jeans are important. And I said to him, well, look, your jeans, you think that you have not given a thought to what you wear. And none of the thinkers you care about seem to think about what they wear. But you are wearing jeans. And jeans have a very peculiar origin. Their name tells you that they have a connection to Genoa. Uh, they, um, de denim, of course, is related to the region of Nîmes, right? Of course, in France, there's a kind of history 
history of 50s Americana, um, the development of American industry through the genes, right? And genes now, something like, I think something like 90% of genes, are ma- if you're wearing a pair of jeans, that you're, they're more than likely to have been made in a particular region of southern India, where the women, women's hands have turned blue from handling the indigo dye, and their local fertility myths have got caught up with their work. So if you're pregnant, you're not allowed to stare the dye in case it instigates the miscarriage. The cuddy, the blue-handed cuddy women of India, basically. And I said to him, so you're sitting there in your jeans and you think you are, uh, you, you, you are, you live in some cerebral realm, but here you are in your jeans and your jeans connect you to so many different kinds of people. The, your clothes have passed through so many hands. And when we talk about the ways that we're connected to other people, well, we're immediately talking about ethics. So how dare you think that your clothes would not be philosophically important? And that sort of... I don't know if he was chastened by it. I think he felt that... um, Maybe he thought it was a challenge, but I, I took it as a challenge, certainly, that it seemed to me everywhere I looked in philosophy, the philosophy I loved, people talked about... Um, a different, a distinction between what it might seem like to appear. When they talked about appearance, people like Kant or Plato even, they weren't talking about physical appearance, they weren't talking about the way you presented yourself. But you could think about physical appearance in that way. And lots of philosophers, the philosophers I loved, um, have any of you ever seen Elaine Siksu talk? I mean, she wears, like, turbans. Uh, Someone once described Derrida as looking like a rakish ski instructor. Um, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, right, wore... um, uh, ski wear uh, because she she couldn't afford to put the heating on um, and she couldn't afford uh, during uh, wartime rations um, to save on water she would wear the turban not to wash her hair so it's not as though philosophers didn't have a life of the body and that they weren't thinking about they, the stuff they wore and in my book I started to think about a particularly phenomenology that's the, the, the area of philosophy that I'm really interested in I'm interested in the ways that we describe what it means to walk through the world and it's a world with other peoples which which means that it must be ethical or we must think about our ethical relationship to others and in phenomenology we pay particular attention to our ability to evoke the world so that somebody else might be able to apprehend it so I when I was talking about my book when I was pitching my book to lots of audiences I would say that what my book wants to do is to tell you what does it do you remember what it's like on the first cold day of September when you put on your winter coat that feeling of putting on your warm coat when you step out into the cold day or if you're someone like me who has like 50 bags in fact as I ran into the stage I had to hand over three bags to Nena <laughs> to them away but why does somebody pack things and someone like me is planning ahead and thinking about all sorts of encounters and problems and dilemmas that might happen in my day but the question is when you pack your bag in the morning when you p- pack your pocket what are you preparing for what is it without which life will stall and I talk about the bag as a way of as a metaphor for selfhood that we are all containers and vessels but also as a way of understanding things like statelessness about Mm. what it means to be without a home or to have to leave home without enough stuff um, and who has, the, who has the luxury of packing a bag and being able to, to sail off to a different country and who doesn't? Um, so all of those see, things seem to me philosophically interesting, ethically interesting. I'll just say t- two, two things to, to close why I think it's interesting and important to think about fashion, beauty, dress in philosophical terms. One is that self-consciousness is often regarded as an objective of philosophical thinking, um, being alert or being some realizing something about oneself self consciousness is a really desirable quality whereas narcissism is undesirable and I think that's right that narcissism seems to refer to a kind of excessive self absorption but self-consciousness is desirable and I wanted to think about narcissism differently that there might be a way in which philosophical self-consciousness is actually a version of narcissism or narcissism is a version of philosophical self-consciousness except narcissism of course oh Sarah I'm so sorry would you like some water would that help (laughs) should we pass them down Um, this is about narcissism actually right the narcissist doesn't realize that when they look in the mirror that that is them that's what the narcissist story is 
Narcissus falls in love with his reflection, but he doesn't realize it's him. He thinks it's another person. Well, Narcissus is stupid. Um, but there is a way of thinking about how we engage with ourselves and realizing ourselves as ourselves. And I write in my book about the experience that many women have of looking in the mirror or even when you, look, when you go shopping. I, I think all of us have this facility, but women in particular, that ability to see yourself outside of yourself, to imagine what you look like to others and to recognize yourself as yourself. That seems to me a philosophical <coughs> objective and one that people who work in fashion and beauty and design also think about that kind of weird astral projection that you have when you're able to see yourself outside of yourself. That is a philosophical objective. Um, and then lastly, to, um, um, to make things a bit bleak, <laughs> when I was writing my book, I thought a lot about death, death in clothes. Um, the person, the philosopher I, that most people uh, turn you to when you say you're interested in, in dress is Roland Barthes, and they're right to do that, because Barthes wrote a book called The Fashion System, except that the fashion system isn't that helpful if you want to think about fashion. What's more helpful is Barthes' thoughts about mortality, um, and he writes about... Um, uh, he writes about that in a number of his works, but in Camera Lucida or Lucida, uh, the book of photographs, where he talks about he, that book's written just after his mother's death. Um, and he, he, at that time, he's writing in his journal about his mother. And he says, um, I'll end with this quote. He says, um, he says something about, oh, yes, he says, um, uh, grief is a sort of deposit of rust, of mud, of bitterness of the heart. This is the key bit. He says, I say to myself how barbaric it is not to believe in souls, in the immortality of souls. What a stupid form of truth materialism is. And what he means by that is that he doesn't believe in souls, that Bart is, is an, an arch atheist, but to believe, to be reduced to, to, to believe in the material body, to not believe that a soul will be resurrected, but to be resigned to the material body, that is the burden of grief that our bodies won't last forever. And he's thinking about how hard it is, what a stupid form of truth materialism is, that materialism is a kind of truth, that our bodies will not last forever. And our clothes, in a very peculiar way, mimic that attrition. They wear and they fray and they... They're imprinted with our bodies as a reason why when people we love die, we cling to their clothes and we find it really hard to part with them. Our clothes have a really profound connection, it seems to me, to death. And I wanted to write about that in my book. And I don't, can't think of a more philosophical topic than death. So yeah, I've given you phenomenology, narcissism and death. Those are the reasons uh, fashion uh, is philosophical. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for getting us off to that fascinating start. I'm going to bring in Heather now um, to pick up on these themes about our essential embodiment. And I know that one of the things both of you share is this sense that a lot of people engage with these topics as though they were somehow trivial or frivolous, but actually they are serious subjects for philosophical investigation. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. So obviously... Um Wonderful to be here in so many overlapping themes and also areas of real difference, you know, but one of the things is the trivialness. So you know, I've had exactly your experience. What, this isn't philosophy. What are you doing? It's not important. And you, the sentence in your book where you talk about this being trivialised, which I think is almost word for word the same kind of claim, that, you know, that this is important, it's, it's not important, it's fluffy, it's, it's, it's pink and furry, and it, and it doesn't matter. And, and it matters so much. So some of the themes that I think... Um, we share are about the nature of the self and what it is to be seen from the outside, um, questions about where the self resides, you know, where in the body, brain, um, imagined self mm -hmm. are we, and then questions about what it means to be ageing and dying in a particular mm -hmm. culture of, of ours. So, you know, from my perspective, I'm a moral philosopher, so I'm really interested in the way that our values are changing and the way they shape who we think we are and what we do. And the bit that I focus on particularly is um, about how we have got to the point, I argue, that for very many people our bodies really have become ourselves and our value frameworks are increasingly tied up with a belief that a better body will lead to a better life. So I'm just going to read you a quote that is in the book, but it's, I think it's a beautiful quote from a 16-year-old girl in that it embodies so much of this culture that is, is often uncalled out. It's kind of all around us, but we don't call it out. So she says, I think people think, oh, I have to look like that, because they think they will have a perfect life as well. 
if I'm beautiful, if I'm attractive, if I'm skinny, then everything else in my life has to come up. Like my school grades will come up. I'll get a boyfriend. You know, I'll have a great social life. And this is followed quite quickly by, I reckon that if I fitted into size 10 jeans, I would be happier. I'd rather have that than straight A's. So I'm kind of playing with this notion of what would it mean if our ethical values and frameworks really were ones where we actually took seriously some of those claims about a better (coughs) body, meaning a better life. And and this transformation is happening all around us. So, you know, our moral frameworks, these are the things that we strive for, they're the things that we organise our daily life around. Um, And then there are also the things that we do our long-term goals around. And increasingly, we are kind of, you know, to go back to the the philosophers we mentioned, like Plato and Aristotle, they think we think this will deliver the goods of the good life, that if we're thinner, firmer, smoother, younger, somehow we'll magically be promoted, have a better job, have a better partner, and we'll just sort of be better. And we can see this embedding all around. So people constantly say, throw away lines, right? You know, so we're good when we say no thanks to the naughty cake, you know, or we're um, bad when we let ourselves slip, when we let ourselves go. And by this increasingly, we don't, it's not a throwaway comment, it's telling us something very profound about who we think we are. Um, And success and failure is increasingly measured in this moral way, not in this aesthetic way. Um, And if you think about things like New Year's resolutions, so in 2019, 75% of people's top three New Year's resolutions were all about the body. Mm. Um, You know, and you know, these are the things that people want to make them better selves. So this is a complete transformation in what we think human beings are, and one that we really haven't captured and named. And only when you call it can you begin to see it. So if you look at some diary entries and resolutions from the 1890s, they're all things like, oh, I resolved to think before I speak. I resolved to be a better daughter. I resolved to study with some intensity. You know, these are the the same kind of teenage girls' diaries. And if you compare that to how they think they will improve now... Now, it is definitely about making the appearance great. And you can see it's not just young people. You know, there's a wonderful book called Bikini Ready Mums where you prove you're a good mum by getting back into shape after the baby. And we no longer do we have magazine shoots with husbands and babies like we did in the 80s. Now we just have to have the bikini body. So there's a real sense that, that this, is, this is changing. It's kind of happening. And philosophers haven't called it out. And philosophers are the people who are supposed to do things about our value frameworks. And you can see that how what it means to fail is now being cashed out in this sense as well and you can see the moral emotions that attach to beauty are the same kind of moral emotions that used to attach to other kind of value failures so it's shame is now doing exactly the same kind of work that it used to do in traditional accounts of moral failure so when you say things like you should not let yourself go or it's your fault you let yourself go, or you should be ashamed to turn up looking like that. These are absolutely mapping to things like, you should not have lied, you should be ashamed to have cheated in that test. That's a real change in what we think we should value. And these are moral. The shame is not about something, a partial bit, it's not minor, it's shame of the self. And this appears across beauty practices, shame of body hair, shame of wrinkles, shame of being badly dressed, mm-hmm. and fat shaming being absolutely prevalent. So I'm just going to finish with, you know, so, so I, think that, I think the philosophy is, is embedded in how we think about appearance, how we think about our sense of self, all these things mm-hmm. that were already being called out. And I guess I also want to just say something about the way that's moving, that as our bodies become ourselves, we're increasingly under pressure to change our bodies in order to fix ourselves. So there's somehow if we fix our bodies. And it's no surprise that as this happens, this becomes something that we think we have to do and what's required to be normal is rising. So it's really philosophically profound and in a very fundamental way it's about identity it's about the very what what do we think human beings are it's about what do we value in our daily lives and our long-term goals right you know just to finish with with death we all (laughs) sag wrinkle and die right this is not a good ideal but nonetheless it is increasingly the dominant one and then it's about how we should live both on our own and with each other as we all spend so much more time worrying about how we look chasing the perfect body 
comes back to all those justice things of what we are and are not doing. And I was struck by the indigo hands from the denim that I am wearing. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, um, I've got some, some bits about things that you don't think about in beauty justice. You know, we have similar reproductive problems with um, in, increasing use of nail bars and gel nails. You know, the, and, you know the, the, we are so bound up from ourselves to the global trade on how we place this as such an important thing. So philosophically everywhere, and all those people that told us it wasn't philosophical, they're just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you. And I'd like to bring in Yashka at this point, because I'd like to hear how you navigate these sorts of themes from within the world mm. of fashion and design. Mm. Well, I, st- I started doing fashion because I wanted to find alternative ways of, of doing philosophy. Mm. Um, mm. And the, f- the feeling was is that and we tend to think that doing philosophy has to be done through language or else through formal logic. And actually it felt to me that we, could, we can express an argument or an idea, sometimes more articulately, through an object. Mm. Um, and along with that, um, if, we, if we think that, that our thinking is, is not only structured through language, but we open it up to think that our, our unconscious mind and, and our psyches are structured perhaps more from from somatic experience, so from feeling what it's like to be in a body, then then design becomes really relevant because design, through mediating um, the bodily experiences and, and perhaps reinforcing the idea of, say, a separation between that thing we call the self and that thing we might call the external world, actually then, um, in consequence, constructs or, or, or at least has some effect on, on thinking. Um, and that, that felt really really evident, really, really, really obvious to me. And, and so then the, the next question was, well, why, why has fashion been overlooked from a philosophical standpoint, whereas with, in, with something like architecture, it, it's, it's been more considered. And I was thinking maybe with architecture, it takes a long time to build a building. Um, and, and so you have got lots of time to think about it. Whereas with fashion, although it doesn't have to, it changes very regularly. Um, although that's changing now as well. So by the time you've made, made a collection, maybe you, you're, you're thinking about the next thing. Or, um, or, I mean, that's just one idea. In terms of the connection between why I, why I go to architecture is because actually the, the clothing we wear is rather like the homes we live in. Both of them um, protect us. Both of them mediate between the public and the private sphere, say. Both of them, in some sense, give us, give us an idea of how we might live, what we might... Um, do in our houses, similarly how we might move in our bodies. Um, and then along with that, so, so thinking more about kind of how, how philosophy and fashion meet, for me as a designer, I felt like there are, there are two ways of designing. So one can take a concept that already exists, let's say a pair of trousers, and you could innovate them in some way, hopefully. Um, say, say, make them in a new colour, say, make them in red. And for me, that's, that's this first type of design, which would be making, m- making many tokens, really, of the same type, which is trouser. And the second kind of design would be designing new concepts, so designing things that don't yet exist, designing things that don't yet have names for them, that are slippery or that we can't quite understand what, what they are. And, and for me, that's, that's the really interesting thing because that positions, positions you as a designer as, as, at the kind of genesis of meaning, and, and I think it's a deeply philosophical question what kind of meaning we would want to conjure into the world. Um, and then as an example of this, I've been thinking a lot about, about weaving. So weaving is an example of how objects and processes can bring about, construct, and constitute meaning. So weaving, of course, wasn't invented at once, and it was, it was done in different ways in many different places and across, across different times. But if we, if we take the, the act of weaving, which entailed some form of relationship between person and animal and land and the kind of the stories that wove them all together as well, what, what happened, as well as creating cloth, is it created all these different metaphors that we use. Now, mm. when, I, when I said, yeah. I, I mentioned weaving, so we, we talk about the fabric of society, we talk about um, being, kind of losing one's thread, we talk about um, weaving things together. And, and I feel like those metaphors that we use don't just um, 
they're not just stand-ins for other things, for other, for other, for other, me- other metaphors that we could, could equally use for the same concept. Actually, the very metaphor that we use um, takes part in, in the meaning. So, so without weaving, we wouldn't be able to think um, about, about the things that we do. Yeah. Isn't this brilliant? <laughs> I'm going to have to come back to you now, okay. Shahida, because um, what Yashka was saying is making me think of the part in your book where you say, I think of clothes as ideas. Yeah. Another way of doing philosophy, I think of clothes as ideas. So could you elaborate on that element, this other way of doing philosophy through um, textures, fabrics, these kinds of metaphors that clothes yeah. bring for us? Yeah, I think um, that's such a good question. And Yashka's made my brain go... <laughs> explode (laughs) um so i kept it's sort of what you were saying yashka about how certain things are almost allowed to be concepts Mm. or ideas so uh, why why and why could a building be thought as of philosophically and i'm thinking of um i'm thinking of when wittgenstein designs the house Mm. in Mm -hmm. vienna and he decides to put in a staircase he has the ceiling lifted by three quarters of an inch and for what reason, <laughs> except that for him, the building is a concept, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, that, you know, where, where one, uh, when, when you can no longer speak, you know, what do you do? Well, you build, a, you build this amazing house. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about how poems and paint, we're used to thinking about poems and paintings um, as ideas and buildings as ideas. But the idea that a garment might be an idea seems uh, absurd, mm. um, except that there is absolutely nothing close to your skin, at any given moment, for most of the day, you will be clothed, and there will be nothing closer to your skin than that gorgeous pink, multi-toned <laughs> wool. Or I have a, a full version of synesthesia, so I'm very alert to textures. So I, um, so a synthetic orange mac, right, or an anorak, or that gorgeous, slightly bubbled black fur, right, that I can see. I can feel that warmth. I know what that means. And those things, and at any given moment, we're walking through the street, and your quilted sleeve will brush against my polyester later at dinner, and your, and your denim, and that excites me. And it seems to me that is an idea, right, that we are in proximity, and we are elbowing each other and jostling for space, um, with each other, and we are close to each other. And I, one of the things I wanted to to write in my book was to to make a to find the ways in which ph- philosophy could be a resource to think differently about clothes. And perhaps you and I differ in this way, Yashka, because you are a person who isn't obsessed with the linguistic because you can see ideas in objects. Whereas for me, I I say in my book that I found very often in my life that if you are a person who loves language, you very often love clothes. That's been one of my experiences. And for me, it is bound up with language that somehow my ability to say the word turquoise brings that color turquoise. Nothing else in the world is turquoise other than turquoise and I think about if I describe to you you know a mid-length beige coat with tortoiseshell buttons and a belt there is no other word for it than trench coat when I say trench coat that is what you see and the the, the ability to attach a word to an object <clears throat> seemed to me you know, obviously the function of language, but very particular to clothes. And I was very interested in how language sometimes seems to be awaiting a garment. And also sometimes mm. garments seem to solicit language, and mm. I wanted to be able to write those things. So, and those seemed to me seemed to be really interesting phenomena, that this thing was not just a flippant garment. And I think you're right that maybe the reason... F- so I was trying to think about how philosophy could pr- provide the resources to think thoughtfully about fashion, but also inversely or conversely, I was thinking about how fashion or dress is everywhere in philosophy. Mm-hmm. That seems to me the case. And I, I talk about Adolf Luce, the um, architect, and he says the suit is a habitable structure, mm-hmm. right? That we live in a suit. Um, <clears throat> and I was thinking, but... I mean, that's an architect, of course he would think that. He would, but I think lots of philosophers do have a sense of what that there are the the, the textile metaphors when I was looking for them seem to be everywhere mm, mm. Um, uh, and I, I talk about them at the, the beginning of my book and I, so I was trying to find the resources from one to feed the other and back and forth but it also seemed to me that you could think about particular ideas with particular garments which is what I mm. try to do in my book I talk about um, mobility and the freedom of movement in relationship to suitcases and bags mm. for instance I talk about um, 
the diversity of our species, our species being, that's what Marx calls it in um, philosophical and economic manuscripts, what it means to be a diverse species and how our shoes enable that. Mm. So I f there are ways in which you can think about particular kinds of garments conceptually, and that, that's what I mean by clothes mm. are ideas. Mm. Mm. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I'm just going to move straight on, um, thinking of something that Yashka said. You know, he said, well, what, why is it that fashion and, and beauty have been overlooked by philosophy? And it seems to me obvious that there's a gender element <laughs> going on here. So I'm going to go straight back to you, Heather, and ask you about this. You know, why are fashion and beauty feminist issues? Okay, so, I mean, the one place where um, philosophers have paid attention to fashion and beauty is feminist philosophy. Um, and they have worried about it for a long time, although not, not so much recently. Right? We've had a, quite a lull, um, and um, it's nearly always been quite negative. So, you know, in, in second wave feminism, we have these very um, traditional critiques that, you know, beauty and fashion, these are all things that women have to do, that men don't have to do. So it's a kind of double whammy, right? So if you're a woman, you have to learn all these skills. They're quite time-consuming. Beauty practices are generally time, quite time-consuming and demanding. But then they're just trivial skills, back to, back to the trivial, right? You know, you know. Um, so, you, it, you know, you get got on both fronts. So these are just ways, um, mm. simple mm. gender exploitation critique that beauty practices, feminine practices, feminine dress, these are all ways to contain and constrain women, you know, the dress being a good example, which you pull out very much in your book. Um, but that, that's a, the, the trouble with, with running those arguments now is that they rely on two very clear um, genders, one of which subordinated and, and does the practice, and one which is dominating and doesn't. Mm. So, like, to give you a, a really clear quote from, from a wonderful book that you should all read if you haven't, Sandra Bartke's book, about um, domination, right? She says, and this is, is, is just captures that view. The art of makeup is the art of disguise, which presupposes that a woman's face, unpainted, is defective. Soap and water, a shave, and routine attention to hygiene may be enough for him. For her, they are not. Now, as I was writing Perfect Me, you know, these arguments they're just they're just creaking at the seams, right? You can't run exploitation arguments without inequality, right? It's literally not possible. That's where, that's where the, you know, philosophical magic lies. You have to have inequality to make exploitation work. And we increasingly just don't have it, right? Young men, they're suffering from body image anxiety. They have low body esteem. Around a third of sufferers, young sufferers of eating disorders are now male. The ideals that men are aspiring to, um, like very men and women's ideals, are becoming far less realistic and more demanding. So I'm not saying it's all the same, there's a load of gendered stuff still going on, but what I am saying is that men are doing body work too. Um, and the kind of ideals that they're aspiring to have a lot of overlaps with women's ideals. So they're firm, they're smooth, and they're young. And so while they're not thin, they're definitely not fat. Big, really big, but not fat. So we also see men increasingly going under the knife, male grooming product, products of those areas of growth for cosmetic companies. Mm -hmm. And the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons uses the words epic rise in um, male liposuction and man boob reductions, which it terms the daddy makeover. Mm -hmm. so, and, you know, if, if some of my work about tracking a global rise in beauty is, is if Brazil's at the top of the curve for women... If it turns out it's also the top of the curve for men, then as the biggest growing demographic in Brazil for cosmetic surgery is men, then this might just be, be have some things running. So we're doing more to meet beauty standards across demographics, more just to be normal, and I track all kinds of things from like body hair removal all the way to surgery. So while it's the case that the footballer's wife probably still does more than the footballer, they probably both do less than the footballer's mother once did. So, and I'd be interested to know whether you agree with me here, because one of the wonderful things about reading this, this book that's not only absolutely fascinating, it's the most beautiful work of art. Yes. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's really amazing. I mean, it's really not, not, not in the same, not in the same league. Um, uh, but I, I, it really made me reflect, because clothes aren't actually something that I talk a lot about, and that, that's a, a failure um, uh, that, I, that I have been brought up against quite hard but it, one of the things that I do think about a lot is of course the body beneath the clothes and there's a, there's a strange thing about more diversity in clothes um, perhaps we've got more than we ever had or we're beginning to 
Uh, but we have much less freedom in the bodies underneath the clothes. So the focus on demandingness, I, I think, is moving to the naked body. Um, so in one way we might have more freedom, but in another way we have less. And, and I'm thinking here about things like the Love Island body, and I do spend a lot of time thinking about things like the Love Island body. <laughs> um, you know, if you look at what's influencing young women and girls and, and where despair's coming from, it's, it's around things like that. And even when those bodies are closed, they're not closed in some of the interesting ways that you talk about. The clothes are designed, even when they're not wearing bikinis, which is not that often, but when they go out on their dates, the clothes are all completely figure-hugging. They are usually one colour and there is not a, a, a shape or, a, a, or a, a, a kindness in the clothing. It's, it's just body stockings, basically. Mm. So whatever you think about the harshest of fashion trends that we've had, and we've had some pretty harsh ones, corsets and foot binding, I talk about a lot. We might be seeing corsets coming back. Um, these, were, these were ways to do artifice, right? They concealed, they shaped... They, they, they allowed you to dress the body, and it was the dressed body that's the product. So whatever was underneath, there was a chance to shape it and to do something to reach that ideal. Um, and so even if we think that some of our current ideals aren't as demanding as some of those past ones, and I actually think they perhaps they are, the focus from the clothed body to the naked body is, is, is a change. It's a change from the cut of the dress to the cut of the breast and the buttock. And, and that's different, right? We haven't been able to do this before, and we haven't really taken into account just how different that is. And if you look at the rise in surgery, and even more the rise of people who want to have surgery, so over 50% of Brits between 18 and 34, um, there's a real difference happening here. So, you know, I don't want to say, and I never say, you should do these things, you shouldn't do these things. I'm absolutely not about telling individuals what to do and not do with their bodies. The only exception I make is that I've got a long description and, um, in the book about the difference between breast lifts and buttock lifts, um, completely factual by a wonderful um, cosmetic surgeon, just describing just how dangerous it is to have a surgery of an implant in that particular place, so near to other places that you can't see, can't clean properly, and unlike the breast, you have to move your bum. You cannot walk, sit, stand. You know, so that's the only one that I say. But the, the point is that we're cutting our bodies almost in the same way that we used to buy our clothes. So I just want to finish with, you know, in the, in, from the why is it important from feminism. Well, it's part, partly important from the feminism is that we're moving into a place where some of those odd arguments, they're really not working. But the inequality isn't, isn't necessarily a good thing because we're engaging in, in, in something much more harmful with, with very little thought. So we've always judged status and identity on appearance. You know, it, it's told us about the jobs we do, the roles we have, our religion, our professions lots about identity. So in medieval Geneva, you would not have wanted to signal that you were not a Puritan. You would have worn your black and white, but you'd have still said something about your status by the quality of your lace, right? And that's still true. But also, as we move to writing ourselves on our bodies more than our clothes, the inside is becoming as important as how we dress the outside. And sometimes we're not allowed to dress the outside without being seen as having failed in some way. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heather. Um, that was incredibly rich, and the thing that stands out for me was your line about moving from the cut of the dress to the cut of the breast. Mm. Uh, Yashka, I wonder if you could come in at mm. this point. Mm. Yeah, so no, that was what stood out for me as well, um, and the idea, the idea that we would move from, from manipulating the garments to, to I guess, the way I've, I've, mm. I've, I've heard it is, is the idea of then understanding the body to be really clothing that one can also transform. Mm. Mm. It feels to me that the, the two come together and that they should be dealt with as a kind of a, a complex unity. So, so in, the, in the time of corsets, they shaped the body, but it was also the human who was shaping the body through the corset. I don't know. I'm, is, is the corset similar to the scalpel, I'm, I'm curious, you know, in the sense that both of them were shaping. Mm. Um, yeah, really interesting, really interesting. Um, I, guess, I guess my direction towards this topic is, is thinking 
Of course, objects do their part in structuring inequality in a massive way. And without, without the tools we have, um, like corsets or stilettos, I think it would be much harder for us to talk about concepts like gender. And I think, I think, it, would also, I mean, I think it would be much harder to talk about concepts like identity as well, perhaps, um, in, terms of, in terms of the inequalities that we, we spot um, and that we experience in society. Um, so, so then from, from my, from a designer's perspective, um, in terms of gender, because this is also something I'm deeply interested in, it feels to me that if we take the idea that gender is perhaps constructed through the objects, when we really look at objects in and of themselves, um, there's no gender in them at all. And collectively, we have a really bad memory of, of this. So 100 years ago, blue might have been considered a more delicate and feminine color, um, and pink more masculine. I'm never really sure what feminine and masculine mean without the tools that I'm talking about in order to talk about femininity and masculinity. Um, I think there's something interesting about the fact that we have such, such bad memories about that, which perhaps suggests the fragility of the very concepts that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so when I design... Um, I might design a, a garment and, and of course the idea is, is that anyone should be able to wear it if they choose. Um, of course it's harder for some people than it is for others to wear some garments like dresses um, but I think it's really important that we or at least as designers perhaps also as wearers I think absolutely that we train ourselves to see the object in and of itself beyond all the things we pin to it. Um, if we could kind of unpin all, all the all the concepts we add to, say, a skirt, um, then, then the skirt becomes a, a, an interesting architectural thing. What does it do? Does it allow us to move our, our bodies in the ways that we want to? So then I would say that in terms of the use of objects, it would be about whether or not they're being prescribed or not. So um, the objects in themselves, other than a few things, perhaps like corsets and, and foot binding, um, bras have originated in some sense from the boning in corsets um, so we, we, there's no reason for us to have um, underwiring so um, maybe, maybe there are objects like that that we might say are more problematic but more so it would be the prescriptive element that, that would be problematic I think there's one interesting other, other point that, that happens when you're designing is that you have to have an idea of who you're designing in mind mm -hmm. and that becomes a kind of relationship. I've, I've been thinking of it um, like the relationship between the lover and the beloved, and, and, and the beloved is far away and absent, and po possibly that's a good thing to begin with because you can kind of project in whatever you like. And the beautiful thing about fashion, and also the terrible thing, is that what you're creating is um, potentially either constructing and reinforcing or deconstructing potential or ideal worlds. So... So it's a very powerful position to be in when you're playing with a kind of empty vessel that you're filling with your idea of, of, of what a human body is or what a female body is, um, in the case of the thinking that I've been doing. And so when you go into a shop and, and some, some clothing brands might fit you better than others, that's because the fit model, so the, the model who depends what kind of studio, or depends what kind of fashion brand um, you're working in, but a model might stand in the studio and, and the designer will drape around that, that model. And the clothing, which is then mass-produced for, for lots and lots of people, is made off this one, one frame. And, and I, guess, I guess the best we could hope is that the designer would have been conscious about that and might have designed in order to ensure that the designs would be able to expand from that one. And then, and then it becomes perhaps problematic when, when there's all of, these, all of these unconscious ideas that the designer puts into their idea of, this, of, this, of, of really when you create a garment, you're kind of creating a space for the human to exist in. And so if you don't create enough space for that, then you're, then you're, you're kind of shaving off potential, um, potential for the human to, to appear in. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is getting me thinking about a, a really interesting element in, in both Heather and Shahida's books where, you know, Heather, at the beginning, you talk about there's an image that people have of a philosopher and it's not a woman anyway. Yeah. And then 
add in a woman who's dressed in high heels or who's wearing lipstick. That really isn't the image that people have as a, of a philosopher. So if you come to a, a philosophical event or, or a philosophical career in that kind of guise, in a way, you're disempowered because of people's perceptions. But in another way, it's empowering because it's subversive. And there's something that you grapple with, Shahida, as, as, as somebody who's writing as a woman who has a love of very uncomfortable shoes with very high heels. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You know, why on earth would a woman who's very familiar with all of these kinds of considerations, space in the body and so on, yeah. choose to wear very high heels or a tight dress that inhibits movement? So... Over to you yeah. for some thoughts on well, this. I, I don't have a defence for that. I don't think our job is to to make a defence, but rather the philosopher's job is to think about why pain has been coupled with the experience of femininity mm. for so long. That is historic, and in lots of ways, actually, in the fashion industry, not just in foot binding and high-heeled shoes and bras, mm. but also in the history of the production of textiles, which have always historically been a work that has fallen to women to the greater majority and have through the history of 19th century industrialization haven't always been the phrase i use is that the, the fashion industry has n not been conducive to the well-being of women not just in the things that it makes but in the way that it makes them and we haven't yet talked about i mean yashka's practice is of course exceptional in that mm -hmm. right? yeah. um conducive to the well-being of everybody but you know the the arsenic that 19th century dye makers would be handling um the, I use the case study of Marianne Walkley, who's in Marx's capital, actually. Uh, she's a, the 20-year-old seamstress who dies of overwork. Um, and John Tenniel, I've got my students here, she's a um, fairy tale person, so she knows this. The John Tenniel sketch um, of uh, the girl look, in, looking in the looking glass. She's a Cinderella girl, woman in this billowing ball gown. And in the corner of the reflection that she's looking at is the figure of the seamstress, Marianne Walkley, who's a corpse, basically. It's just collapsed in the corner. It's n not been conducive to the well-being of women. And we have to think about why that is. At the same time, I mean, this is speaking to a certain thought I have about your book. Heather, which is that when I read it, and it's such a, an astonishingly meticulously researched book, I felt really chastened because you're right that fashion and beauty are industries that have not been dedicated to the well-being of women, that have been hurt, hurtful and continue to be hurtful in so many ways. And I wanted to acknowledge that in my book, and I talk about shame, about the, the problem of... Um, I do use the story of, there's a Virginia Woolf st short story about um, a young woman who goes to a party and it's called The New Dress. And um, she buys a new dress for the party. And lots of us would have done this, where you have uh, great hopes for what you're going to look like in this new dress. And she commissions this new dress and she spends all her money on it. And this is, uh, it's actually after Mrs. Dalloway's party. So it's so one of those stories that's connected to Mrs. Dalloway. And um, it's a dress that the collar's too high and it's a slightly yellow and it's, it's not quite right for the looser shaped um, Mrs. Dalloway silhouette. Mm -hmm. And she knows as soon as she turns up at the party that she's made this terrible mistake. And she just sinks with shame and cowers in the corner. And all, she, ought, she ought not to be feeling that, but that is how she feels. And I write about that feeling of shame. It seems to me the philosopher's job is to write about that too, and also the pleasures. And so one of the things I t write about shoes is to say that who, who, is, who, is, who is to say that I'm not allowed to wear heels? Um, who, is the, who is to prohibit me from wearing what I want to wear? I wear a heel because I'm extremely small and I like the way that it allows me to try to reset the balance. Also, I have to think about focal length. If you're a tall person, you probably have this too, right? When you're sat talking to somebody or stood talking to somebody, you have to think about where you position yourself so that you have the right focal length. And a shoe cants the heel and it erects the spine and it gives me a certain poise, which I like. But having said that, I'll take my heels off and put my trainers on when I go home, right? And I don't want someone telling me I'm prohibited from doing that. I think that's utterly unfair. But that brings me to this point that we don't always have choices about what we get to wear, not just because women's wear isn't always conducive to well-being, but we also live in a global culture where we're very lucky, where we're able to wear what we want, but many people aren't able to wear the things that they want. And that also seems to me you know, really serious consideration, right? Mm -hmm. The right to be able to wear what you want 
whether it's the right to wear a veil or the right not to wear a veil. I mean, that is the most obvious example. And I didn't feel well placed to argue that. In a way, I feel like that there's always too much attention drawn to the veil, and I'm not sure that, that it's fair, but I think it's an argument that applies to everything. I feel like you have the right to wear and the right not to wear, mm. whether it's good for you or not. Wow, I could listen all day. Um, well, we've, we've heard a lot, haven't we, about the, the challenges, the negatives, the costs and the harms. So I wonder if we could turn now to the positives. And I, I'll start with Yashka. Do you think that fashion and beauty can be a force for good in the world? Um, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> and, and I certainly design with that in mind and, and think, about, think about design um, with that. Mm -hmm. so, so as I mentioned earlier, um, one, of my, one of my main assumptions, I guess you could, you mm -hmm. could, you could summarize it as, as thinking about how we can bring, bring embodied cognition into design. So embodied cognition, which would, would um, I mean, and extended and distributed, you know, various types, but we just stick with embodied cognition. So the idea that your body and the different um, states that it's in gives rise, constructs, or constrains cognition. And as I mentioned, through designing, you mediate your body's experience. And there are many different ways in which that, that the, you know, there are lots of mechanisms in which, case, in, in, in which that happens, and, and so gives rise to certain, um, certain states, certain states of mind. So, so that just seems astounding, because it means that everything is is giving rise to not only the content of our thoughts, but the way we're thinking. So the kind of the structure, the kind of the um, whether we think a thing is a thing in itself, or whether we think that things burst from them, burst forth from themselves, and don't really exist in themselves again. And a few minutes later, when we go back to them, and they are not there. Um, so, bearing in mind embodied cognition, it feels like if we're designing humans and individuals as well as societies when we're designing, then, then the question is, well, how, how should we do that? Because one wouldn't want to be prescriptive. Um, one would want to be responsible about the type of humans um, and societies one were, or, or at least the, the, the potential worlds one was offering up for humans to exist in. Um, and I feel very much like what um, Shahida was saying is, is, is that objects in themselves, one wouldn't want to say were wrong or right. Mm. So rather, the, the task comes as a designer is that you're trying to create, personally I design from the place where I'm trying to create objects that allow their wearers to become more aware of the fact that they themselves can participate in the creation of concepts and that they themselves are, um, so that they, they become more aware of the fact that things are acting upon them. Um, yeah. So, so I'll give, actually I think I can, I can click. Maybe? Yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> Other one? Other. That one. Should I try Crack it along. Yeah. yeah. It's not terribly problematic. Can you do it here? Yeah. Is there somewhere here? It's okay. It's not necessary. Ah, ah, ah. Got it. Okay. Tell me if you want me to click along. You can click along. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, there are just two. Thank you, Shahida. So, um, so these are some of the clothes that I've been. So, so okay. So, if when we're designing, we're designing humans, and if when we're thinking about the kind of states we want to create, we don't want to be prescriptive. Um, instead, we want to create more. Um, we want to create in the wearers the idea that there are different ways of thinking. Um, but not prescribe those different ways of thinking. Um, then, for me, I, I, I landed on the idea of an unstable object. So, so these garments are largely constructed in halves. So we have the, the two um, two-piece trousers. And like I was saying earlier on, the the aim is to try and create new concepts. But actually, that's really difficult. So, so something like two-piece trousers feels like they're they're taking me closer um, 
to the idea of something that is slippery, so it's slipping in between the gaps of concepts. In terms of, in terms of um, what I've been working on and what I think is particularly hopeful for, for um, at least for my work, um, is to do with containment. And we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier on, Shahida was talking about containment in, in terms of bags and things as well as the self. So I've been thinking about, um, about the sense of the body as a container. Um, and whether or not that is an innate or intrinsic thing that we have to do. So we tend, we tend to think, actually, we take for granted the fact that our body is a container. We tend to say we feel full up or fed up or brimming over with anger. And all of those things um, would suggest that, that we think there's an inside of ourselves and there's an outside and there's some kind of permeable boundary. And my curiosity is about whether or not that sense of the body as a container on a very on a very deep level the one we, we, kind of the very sense of ourselves as containers could in fact be manipulated through um, the objects around us and so perhaps through coming into contact con, con, coming into contact with with objects that don't themselves have insides and outsides and, and spaces in between we might be able to come to view ourselves not as having insides and outsides and spaces in between. So, so that could be, say, that we could start understanding ourselves more as having a permeable boundary. Mm. We, we could understand, uh, understand ourselves. I mean, from a, from, a, from a physical level, I feel like it also strikes me that we could be conceiving of ourselves as, as in fact, always being in relation to that we don't really have an inside um, when we're breathing, when we're eating, all of these, all of these things that we're doing actually make us continually in relation to. And yet, the fact that we contain ourselves in our bodies, and that we talk about ourselves as being contained in our, in our bodies, and that we we've also created a world full of things that are contained, including concepts themselves, which which I feel like also have a structure of containment. Um, we could we could reposition ourselves as as more relational, and I wonder if 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 the objects around us mm. collapsed a little bit like my clothing continually <laughs> potentially <laughs> state of collapse because um, it might unravel um, might make us also more more able to f to feel us feel feel that those things that we take for granted like a stable self within me or that that the structure of concepts are stable um, might be more might be more fluid and, and and not that I'm proposing that relational is the best one as opposed to the containment um, but rather that we would be able to go between them and and to them anymore and that that flexibility would be would be an interesting state to live in wow <laughs> that's absolutely fascinating uh, permeability the body is container you've given us so much to think about I think this is the perfect moment to open up the floor to the people who are here who I'm sure have lots and lots and lots of questions and then we'll come back to Shahida and Heather to respond um, put your hands up nice and high what I'll do is I'll take a few questions and put them back to our fantastic panel and then we'll come back to you again so I can see a yellow yellow jumper and hand in the air let's start over there and then we'll come to the front here to the black coat that's already been mentioned Sorry. and then <laughs> gray jumper over there on the corner we'll take those three oh, but I have to stand up or? yeah do because we can't see you that would be perfect thank you thank you um, so uh, the way in which I heard uh, most of what was said, um, I found my, myself thinking a lot about the kind of individual relationship to um, clothes, but then also sort of going with your first example, Shahid, about the man wearing jeans and the way in which if there's a general connection, it's one's individual choice to a sort of to the way in which it's connected to all these different industries and in different parts of the world. Um, I was curious, um, you touched upon the veil and I don't, want to speak specifically about the veil, but I'm, I'm curious about the way in which um, clothes that, that function as a kind of uh, depersonalizing tactic, so a uniform or, or religious attire, or you know, whether it's you know, a school uniform or a doctor's outfit, or what are the ways in which those kinds of clothes um, that, that actively seek to take away the significance of the individual, but speak to maybe something significant about the collective, how do they fit into our narrative of how clothes make a human, and, and what can that tell us? Brilliant, thank you. 
Um, hi, thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Um, and thank you for your work. Um, I think there's nothing better in philosophy or no better moment when you've kind of been thinking, having these intuitive thoughts, you know, while you're waiting for your co food to cook in the microwave and, and you sort of have these crazy daydreams and then it gets articulated so beautifully and so... Uh, nicely and it you kind of validates you like okay this is a thought I can have um, so thank you so much for your work I'm so excited to read everything um, my question is I'm so I'm a, currently doing my masters here um, in media and communication so naturally my thought space at the moment is quite media related mm. I'm just quite interested to hear your thoughts on the intersection between media and fashion because they kind of go hand in hand in many ways and media is obviously a a machine that uh, constantly is churning out what uh, and spreading the message of what fashion is and, and isn't. So, yeah, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on, on that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And the final question of this round over there. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, yes, Shaka? Yes, 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 sorry. Um, you spoke about um, fit models from different um, designers mm. and how when we go to uh, buy the clothes, they would fit differently because the different um, uh, fit models would obviously have different shapes. I wanted to talk about the concept of the muse and mm. um, if, if designers are designing for a specific person in mind, mm. what are your thoughts about the muse and that type of woman that might be in the designer's mind? Mm. Thank you. Three wonderful questions to kick us off. So we've got the question about, we've talked about the individual relationship to clothes, but what about the collective aspect? And then the question about media and fashion, which is really important. Um, when you were mentioning the corset, for example, I was thinking about social media. So there's something very interesting, isn't there, about the way in which now we both have this image of the perfect, the perfect model who's dressed in the corset, but then we also have the confession side of social media that's all about how you put on a corset or that you know the here's me without my makeup and let me show you exactly how I do all the shading so you get the the, the image of the perfect but also the behind the scenes shot um, and then the fit models and the muse um, fantastic so who wants to get us started I'm happy to go. Yes. Um, so the depersonalization question I can definitely have a go at. Um, I, I will talk about the veil a little bit just to say that I, I feel like the issue with the veil in terms of how we talk about it is that it is over-determined and under-understood. Mm. Um, and my, my, my position on the veil and the reason I deliberately chose not to write about it, many people I loved dearly, close family members wear the veil and different kinds of veils. Of course, there are different kinds of veils. The chose, reason I chose not to write about it was because Joan Wallach Scott writes about it most brilliantly. She says that, um, you know, um, that everybody, the thing about the veil is that it seems to be depersonalizing. Um, and yet we are all asking, what does it mean? We are constantly asking, what does it mean? And maybe we should stop asking, what does it mean? Maybe it is not our prerogative to ask, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not that I think that the veil is depersonalizing necessarily. I know lots of women who wear veils. One of my great colleagues at, at LCF is Rena Lewis, who thinks precisely about the relationship between um, Muslim fashion, or sometimes what's called modest fashion, which also um, applies to Jewish traditions and other traditions, it's not just Muslim, but how that tradition is bound up with neoliberalism and how fashion designers have bought into it too, that it's totally not about how Islam is not uh, co um, compatible with Western society, but how it proves that Islam is entirely compatible with Western society because of that. But in terms of depersonalization, I do talk about uniforms in my book a little bit, because the thing that I, 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 I was very keen to say in my book from a personal perspective, really, is that, um, and it's why I'm interested in dress rather than fashion per se, is that everything we wear is meaningful, and very many of us will wear uniforms. Um, and there are things that we are saying or doing in our clothes, even when we don't intend to. And I sort of always hate the, the formula that our clothes are an expression of our identity. That seems to me so blasé and um, cheap in a way, that as though our identity were something that could be packaged and easily, glibly expressed in a Ramones t-shirt, right? seems to me that is not what identity is. Uh, if identity is anything, it is constantly in flux. Um, and also, very many of us don't want to say who we are in our clothes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would hold myself up as one of those people too. Uh, very often, what I'm wearing is not about what I want to tell you. It's what I want to keep from you. Mm. Um, and I, I write about 
that, that feeling too, that we are not just saying <clears throat> what we are in the world, but we are also hiding in our clothes. Very many of us are hiding in our clothes. Um, so I'm really interested in uniforms and anonymity and homogeneity. And yeah, yeah, I won't go on. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Heather? I could say, um, it's not an area of expertise, I won't say very much, but just on the fashion and the media and, and social media, and there's a real, you know, so, so um, you know, you're rightly calling out the, the pleasures of beauty, and, and I think there are very many pleasures of beauty, and I think anybody who says it's all bad, they're, 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 they're just, you know, they've completely ignored women's lived experience, mm. and, and it comes from a particular place, and I'm hugely critical of that. There's loads of great things about fashion and beauty and, and very many of them are, uh, are the kind of relational things that we're talking about as well as just the, the enjoyment right the pure enjoyment of of the, the textures and the outside stuff um, and but fashion is being challenged in the in social media and some of that again is you know instagram's as much about the naked body as it is about the closed body and, and there's stuff going on there and, and there are really positive things that you know social media gets very bad press but there are really positive aspects about that the, the democratization of, of a lot of of that stuff is is crucial and, and and you can, you know, you know much more about this than me. But you, you see fashion brands using influencers and developing around them in a way because they, they know that in, so, in some places the horse has bolted and, and you've got to, 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 to do a bit more of a, a conversation, you know, rather than an unveiling. Um, so I think there's really positive, there's really positive things as well as a lot of the negatives that gets called out. Um, and, you know, so I'm quite cynical about some of the body positive claims about diversity in what they're actually presenting. But the notion that we might end up in a world with real diversity you know so, so you know there are there are there are there are lots of opportunities there um, and when people just go oh it's it's all it's all just a business it's like well well no right it's a piece of the puzzle um, but you know if we were obsessed with being great intellects we'd be spending our money on hyper drugs and you know walking around with 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 um, IV lines to make us super clever that's not where we're spending our time money and effort so it's a piece of the puzzle but it's definitely not all to BAME and it ha is, is a, ca a capacitian resource for good because we are in a visual culture mm. um. thank you Yashka the muse <laughs> <laughs> you got one Yashka is it me? <laughs> it's a bit young. <laughs> Definitely. Um, actually, the other day I was, I was feeling really angry about, um, about the idea of the muse, or at least how, how the idea of the muse has, has, has melted and contorted. Um, not to say that I would imagine I would know how it was in the past, but, but the way we think of the muse in the past and the way we use that seems to be actually to be kind of problematic. Um, I think that, yes, it, it, I mean, it relates to the idea of the kind of the place of the positioning myself as the lover in, in relation to this distant beloved. Um, I don't think I like, I don't think I like, I, I don't like what it's become or what it, but, but I feel like, I feel like there is something in reaching towards that which you don't know and and trying to trying to come close to it and and I think that for me design can be very erotic in that sense that you're you're reaching towards something and and then you might you might create a garment and it and it has a whole a whole existence of its own and 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 like you were saying Shahida that there's a feeling there's a feeling to it and What's beautiful is you can you can also step inside the garment, um, but but perhaps also your question when when you ask about muse is, is also perhaps asking about inspiration, and and I think that I think that there's this weird question which goes around in fashion, which is what's your inspiration, <laughs> um, and I find it I find it kind of crazy because I think why would we want of, I, I'm sure it's valuable for a great many people, um, but why would we want to um, create something that's already been created. Why would we want? Why? And I mean, this is just a, a, a big question, which is not not to say that I don't think we should. Although this is not what I do, but but why do we want to put butterflies on garments? Um, why is it that why is it that flowers are the inspiration for a collection? I mean, that just seems deeply unconsidered. Um, and and also about pattern. And I think that. 
and I think that thinking of, think I think maybe I don't know I'm I have an, I have I'm figuring out what I think about pattern because pattern feels more superficial pattern feels like on the surface whereas when you're when you're engaging with the architecture of a garment then you're you're, you're thinking about this, the structure and it feels like you're doing a very different thing um, so mm, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm enjoying this so much. I want more of these conversations in my life. I'm going to open up again. I'd like to take another round of questions before we end. So throw your hands up. Okay, so we've got this question here in the black. Question at the front with a black hat. And question here, blue. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you very much. Um, I was. This is maybe a follow-up to her first question. And I was thinking about... Um, what you said about embodied cognition. Um, is there a way that the clothes could make the human, in your opinion, that's not like just personally, but um, in a social context? So can the clothes make a criminal? Or can the clothes make um, a citizen? Or, um, yeah. Please. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. And I have a very short question. Is what is fashion? I have a, sup a super, super, amount, my understanding of fashion is very superficial. Mm. And I want to hear what's your opinion about fashion. Yeah. Thank you. Could you pass it to that person in the blue behind you? Hi. So my question is, I feel when you're talking about clothing, you're almost starting with the clothing and working back into kind of what it means, say, from a sort of feminist perspective or from what it says about, I don't know, pain in women or vulnerability. But can, when I thought about the question, do clothes make the human, it almost felt like the clothes could have a kind of significance that was beyond um, what can we be read back from them and kind of can they... Um, you know, when people talk about you need to dress for your job and that's going to rise you up the career ladder, can clothes have that such a significant role beyond kind of presenteeism and actually making a real significant change in one's life? Mm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to start with Heather, if I may. Uh, I don't know much about fashion as a thing, so I'm not going to talk about that. So in terms of the clothes making the person, um, that's definitely, you can see that in, that's certainly what people believe. So just like they believe that if they're thin enough, they can have their, you, you'll, there, there are lovely quotes from you know, people like, oh, you know, if you want to be a businesswoman, you imagine yourself as this really skinny woman in a suit, or you, know, you invest in great eyewear. Um, you know, so the notion that what you might want to do is um, do some studying and pass your exams. No, it's like it's a being, imagining being the part is a motivator for, for um, thinking that you will be the part. And you know, that, sound, that sounds a little bit glib. I wasn't meaning to be glib, but I think there's some real truth in that as well. Um, and, and certainly we, we see that empowerment. So, I mean, it comes back to the, the positive and negative. The beauty ideal is fundamentally mixed. It's positive, it's negative, it empowers, it moves. You're always moving between the self that you're unhappy with, you're Imagine transforming self, a bit like you were saying, like you're you know, moving in and out of your containers. Um, so um, I think that our sense is in how we present and imagine presenting can actually change some of the reality around us. That's partly um, in terms of how it's received. Certain shoes, certain shoes, certain garments are received yeah. in certain ways and have certain shared meanings. Sometimes we can challenge and sometimes we can't. Um, and and um, certainly, you know, you don't dress the same way as you go to an interview for a job you really want or to meet you know some potential um employer is the way you dress on a on a saturday night on the pull if we still say that i'm very old <laughs> 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 and that's for good reason right so <laughs> fantastic yashka to put you on the spot what is fashion <laughs> <laughs> i don't know um I don't know. Um, I, I, I think about clothing. Um, I think, can I, can I sidestep the what is fashion part of it and talk about the superficial element? Mm. Um, so there's a really amazing paper by Daniel Miller, and, and mm. it's why are clothes not superficial or something. Mm. Um, and what I took from it is this idea that we tend to think it's superficial because we think that what's on the surface isn't 
isn't of significance because it isn't the self. Um, we, we think that clothing is representing the self and therefore it's one step removed from the, from, from the deep inner true self that you have within you. But, I mean, it, so it depends on what kind of ontology of self you have. If, if, if you're going to position the self deep within you and that it's, it's non-physical, then you might think that anything that comes onto the, onto the shell of that is going to be insignificant. But, but say you place the self... Um, as a thing that only exists in relation to others, that, that you require another in order to see you, um, or that you, um, you, you, be, you, yeah, you become a being because of, of, of how you relate, then, then the clothes become really important because they're the way you meet the world. Um, and I guess, yeah, I don't, yeah, saying that I'm still... I, I still can't answer the first the first <laughs> uh, clothes more than presentation um, <laughs> uh, I was thinking about that in answer to your question about I think your your the two questions were slightly similar about whether the clothes can make the human mm. um, or whether um, and I, I have two answers. And one is that um, anybody who's lived through the first part of the 21st century knows what an orange boiler suit means, mm. right? So there are certain garments yeah. that are for us now politically and morally freighted, and they mark a particular moment. And that garment makes that person uh, an inmate of Guantanamo Bay. It attaches them to all sorts of things. So there are, there are clothes that are obviously designed... In uh, to capture a person. Um, and so, yeah, I would say they can make the human in that way. The other way I, I approach it uh, in my book is to think about why clothes are exceptionally human. And I write about our relationship to animals. It's interesting you said, why do we put butterflies on dresses? And I have a chapter on furs, feathers and skins. And one of the arguments I make is that, well, there are certain things, certain activities that philosophers have thought about for generations that make us human. And we used to talk about essences. Uh, and sometimes we used to talk about values. Um, and then we started talking about behaviours. Gift giving is a particularly human thing to do. Um, mourning the dead is a particularly human thing to do. Wearing clothes is a particularly human thing to do. I think we're the only creatures that do it. So clothes do make us human. And actually in an age of AI, it's worth us thinking <laughs> about what makes us human. Mm -hmm. And clothes, the fabrication of clothes, the consideration of clothes, our reception to other people's clothes make us human, mm -hmm. exceptionally human rather than just animal or like mm. other animals. Mm. We mustn't say just animal. But what does fashion mean? In fashion studies, people are thinking about it really hard because fashion at the moment means poison. It's, it's one of the most polluting industries in the world, right? It's a $2.4 tr trillion dollar industry and it's responsible of 100 billion garments that are made a year 20% of them will be unsold and will end up in landfill and in incineration. So fashion at the moment is poison, is ruining our planet. We have to think really hard about it. But others of us are thinking about fashion in not just as an object or even as a culture, but as a verb. What does it mean to fashion, to self-fashion or to be fashioning yourself? And uh, lots of us are thinking particularly about fashion as a temporal phenomena. So we, we're used to talking about fashion cycles and fashion being... Um, and it's interesting you talking about the building taking so long to, mm. to build, but maybe the thing about fashion is that it refers to a, t a certain kind of temporality, quite a rapid temporality in the condition of working within that kind of time. Um, what, it, what you do in a certain kind of time time that might be what fashion is but lots of us are thinking very hard about what it means yeah it's not just clothes it seems to me well thanks to all of you for those fantastic questions and thanks to our panel for showing us that fashion and beauty are absolutely rich and productive topics for philosophical discussion so anybody who would like to dwell and buy the books or get their books signed do join us outside and for now let's just thank our panel for a wonderful discussion